The following is brought to you by paulacres.net. Uh, welcome, everybody. We are um, here for our second session for today. We have Paul Akers with us. He is the author of, of two secondly and uh, several books, but Banish Sloppiness is the one that Vern had just referenced. And Vern just talked to us on Sunday at our Summit Blitz about how we're looking at the four P's that go with our four decisions. So people, pivot, process, and pricing. Paul is going to be talking about how process can impact our make a productive culture. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. So uh, I'm assuming some of you know who I am and some of you don't. So I'm going to do just a brief introduction, just so you have a little bit of background on me. Uh, people always say, how should I introduce you, Paul? And I say, the best introduction you can give me is just tell people I'm a carpenter. And the reason why is I'm a pretty simple guy. I didn't go to Harvard. I don't have an MBA degree, but I run a, a company that does tens of millions of dollars in business in 40 countries with 3000 distributors worldwide. And uh, we have some pretty astounding results. So you got to kind of wonder how did a carpenter pull off something like that? I didn't go to business school. I don't have a business degree. And yet we've built this amazing organization. So the story is pretty simple. I graduated from high school and I went to work for Bob Taylor, Taylor Guitars, one of the most renowned guitar makers in the world. They make about 700 guitars a, a day and they make them for the best musicians in the world. Everybody plays their guitar, it seems like. Bob's a very close friend of mine. I talk to him regularly. Well, at 17 years old, I went to work with Bob and I learned how to manufacture. I learned how to innovate. I learned how to think way outside the box. And Bob basically changed my life. So then when I graduated from college with a degree in education, I started my own contracting business. I taught, I actually taught industrial arts, but I, I started a contracting business. And one of the things I did is I built custom cabinets. And one night in my home late at night, I was uh, trying to figure out a way to cover a screw hole inside a cabinet. And I was very frustrated because the old methodology was not very effective. So I took a piece of plastic, sprayed some contact adhesive on the back of it, punched out a, a little Christmas tree shape. Actually, my wife was doing creative memories. I got one of her stamps, punched it out, put it over the screw hole, and it worked really well. I showed my rep the next day when they walked into my shop. I said, what do you think of this idea? They looked at it and said, it's a great idea. I went to a trade show three months later after trying to figure out how to make it. I had three employees. Today I have 50 employees, but I had three employees back then. I said, you got to figure out how to do everything with a cap making business because I got to figure out how to make these caps. I started making the caps. The first month I sold like $3,000. The next month I sold $6,000 and $9,000 and $12,000 and $25,000. And the whole thing went off to the races. In the course of the last 21 years since we started it, we have over 800 products now, uh, innovative products for the woodworking industry. So that's kind of the nutshell of who I am and how it all came to happen but there is one part in the story that is the most important part and i haven't told you that yet and here it is so three years into my business i had won uh, business of the year startup business of the year we were making a lot of money things were going great everybody wanted to work for, for us the most common question i was asked was uh, when are you going to go public i want to invest in your company and i was applying for a quarter of a million dollar line of credit from the bank and the bank president came to check out the company to approve it because remember i don't have an mba i didn't have a business degree and they don't generally like to loan a quarter of a million dollars of a line of credit to a small startup cabinet maker or woodworker who doesn't know anything about business that's just not the profile that banks work from but the bank president came into my company and he leaned against one of my machines he crossed his arms and i'll never forget what he said to me he said paul i have never been to a company well so well managed, so well run, I would give you any amount of money you want. And that was obviously very gratifying to me. You know, I, I didn't have the business acumen that most people have. And here this bank president, who is about 65, 70 years old at the time, is very, you know, very uh, well-rounded. He, he knew his way around businesses. And for him to say something like that was pretty flattering. Well, what happened next was even more incredible. So a week later, I hired these Japanese consultants to come in to help me manage some inventory issues I was having because I was importing some things from over in Europe, some raw materials. And again, I didn't have a business background. I didn't deal with international sales, distribution, uh, supply chain management. I, I knew nothing about that. I'm a carpenter. Like I opened up the whole session with, I'm a carpenter. And these young kids came in to my company and they walked around and I said, can you help me with my problems of managing inventory? 
And they said something even more profound than the bank president. They said, I don't know, you're clueless, you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to manufacture. So I went from the highest high to the lowest low in the course of one week. And so they, they, I ended up hiring these young kids because I was curious, instead of getting defensive and saying, get the hell out of here, I don't want to listen to you, you know, I'm, I make a lot more money than you, I'm a lot more successful, you haven't built the company from scratch, you know, yada, yada, yada. I said, okay, I want to learn from you. They charged me 10,000 bucks a week for consulting. They stayed for two weeks. In the first week, they took one of my processes that I was an expert at, that I had developed, that took me 45 minutes to perform this process day in and day out. And in one week, they took it from 45 minutes to five minutes by, through the elimination of waste. Well, I was like, oh gosh, it's beyond being clueless. I'm an idiot. I have no idea what I'm doing. Then they did it to another process called our laser jam. They took it from 45 minutes to seven minutes. At that point, I was convinced I got on the plane, went immediately over to Japan with them, went to Toyota, went to Lexus, saw what they were doing, started to understand the gravity of the concept of lean manufacturing, the Toyota production system. And I was changed. And from that point on, my whole life literally revolves around this subject. I, every book I have, I write about lean. Every moment, every breath I take, I think about continuous improvement. So today's talk is about what is your kata? Kata is the, the Japanese word for routine. So what is your routine that you do as, as in your business that supports your belief systems and what you do? And so I'm gonna walk through what our kata is. So the first thing you need to know about what I'm gonna talk about in the next uh, 45 minutes is I can't teach you anything. So I may be a speaker that speaks around the world in my books in 14 languages, soon to be in 19 languages. And you would say, well, gee, you know, I'm spending my time with you, Paul. You, you should be able to teach me something. Well, the answer is I cannot teach you anything. So this is the very first thing that must be very clear. I cannot teach you anything. What I can do though, is I can show you what we're doing because I'm not gonna be a teacher because immediately that elevates me above you. I'm smarter than you and everything else. And you're the student, I'm the teacher. I'm not interested in doing that. And it doesn't work. And I learned this concept from Toyota specifically because Toyota had to teach uh, the surly Americans when uh, they came to America to build Japanese cars with GM in the newbie plant, they had to teach them how to uh, build Japanese high quality cars. And they realized they couldn't teach the Americans how to do that. The Americans won World War II. The Americans were the best in manufacturing at that point, supposedly. This was big GM, the biggest automaker in the world. How in the world could a bunch of little Japanese uh, engineers teach the GM people anything? So I learned this concept from the Japanese. We're not going to teach you anything. We're just gonna simply show you you what we're doing and then it's your decision what you do with that information it, it, there's no onus on us or anything we're going to show you if you like it you like it if you don't blow me off i don't really care it doesn't matter to me at all you can reject what i'm saying you can say paul you're full of crap you don't know what you're talking about it's not that simple i went to harvard i have an mba it doesn't work that way i, I don't care it's all good or you might say to yourself today i'm open to new ideas you just say Dang it, Paul, I never thought of that before. That is really some interesting stuff. I never thought about that today. Or you can be the hamster. You can keep doing the very same thing you've been doing over and over again and change nothing. And every morning you wake up and you wonder why the hell did that, is that still, the, why am I having the same problems I've always had? And you, you're kind of exhausted at the end of the day, you're going home, you're going, Man, I wish things would get better, but they're really not. So it's your choice what you're gonna do with this thing. So I learned my kata, my routine, my daily routine in Japan, and I'm gonna go through that. But before I go through it, I want you to play, I wanna play a little video of the Numi story, the story I told you about where I learned this concept of not being able to teach anybody anything. So back in uh, 1984, GM closed a plant, or 1982, I think they closed the plant in Fremont, California. It was the worst manufacturing plant in all of GM worldwide. The cars were sabotaged. They had prostitution rings in the, in the, in the, in the manufacturing plant. They had drug rings in the manufacturing plants. The employees were deliberately sabotaging the cars. Most of the cars were towed off the line. They couldn't even run. They couldn't even drive them off the line. It was an epic disaster from start to finish. GM closed the plant. They wanted to know how the Japanese were making these small high quality cars. 
Jip, uh, the Toyota wanted to work in the United States because this was back when Reagan was putting tariffs and, and making it very difficult for the Japanese to import. And so the only choice the Japanese really had to be successful was to start building the cars in America instead of importing them. So they had, uh, they had uh, some urgency to learn how to do this, but they weren't familiar with working in the United States. So they did a joint partnership called the NUMI uh, partnership. And they started working with GM and the conditions were they had to reopen the NUMI plant, make the small quality Japanese cars, but they had to do it with the same GM workers that were sabotaging the cars, that had the prostitution, drug rings, and were doing all the terrible things. But the Japanese had to work with these same people. So that's a pretty tall order. So how did they do that? So let me play the video and it's a real quick video to kind of get an idea what happened. Could Toyota take one of the worst factories on Earth and make it into one of the best, using the exact same workers? Toyota's first step was to send workers like Madrid to the carmaker's Japanese factories. There, Madrid saw a worker misthread a bolt. And then, something totally unexpected happened. The worker reached up to pull a rope hanging overhead, and boom! Boom, they stopped the line. They stopped the line to repair it. Gee, that makes sense. Fix it now. That impressed me, that they want to build a quality car. One bolt. <laughs> One bolt changed my attitude. That was Toyota's philosophy, that workers should be empowered to stop an assembly line, or invent new tools, or do whatever else they feel like they need to do in order to get things done. The idea is that if you give workers the authority to take control, you'll not only unlock innovation, but motivation. After Toyota implemented lean management in Fremont, within just two years, the worst auto plant in the world had become one of the best. If you want your team to take more ownership of their work, then give them more power. Put the responsibility for solving a problem with the person who's closest to that problem, regardless of what their title is, and then step back and watch the productivity skyrocket. So what's interesting about that story is, did you notice that Toyota didn't make that transformation by having a superstar CEO in there? They did it by empowering their workers. They did it by developing a kata or routine that the workers did on a daily basis for the express purpose of developing the people. This is the key. Toyota is determined as their central focus, the development of their people. And the interesting thing about this is most people say, well, you're going to spend all this time teaching and training your people and not building cars. You can't afford to do that. That's a detour, Paul. That's a detour, Toyota. That's a detour from what you're really in, what your intention is or what your what the first intent of your business is. Your intent is to build cars for your customer, but yet you're spending all this time developing and teaching and training your people. That's not what GM did. GM just said, go out on the line and make cars. And they were making crappy cars indeed. And what Toyota did is, no, we're going to develop your people. We're going to teach and train them. We're going to work side by side with them, shoulder to shoulder. And we're going to show you, not teach you, we're going to show you what it means to build a high quality car. And so this Kata that they developed was just remarkable. And that changed everything. So instead of being a detour, this kata became a shortcut. Very counterintuitive, very contrarian to the way most business people think. So this is not a superhero system. This is not you bring in the great CEO that's going to turn everything around. It has nothing to do with that. It's not a superhero program. It is not. What it is, is everybody participating in small ideas. And I will explain. And it's definitely not bureaucracy. Gosh, there's nothing worse than the flavor of the month. Somebody brings in a new thing and you've got all this new work you have to do. It's not bureaucracy. That's not what I'm talking about. And it's not charts and graphs. It's not a bunch of smart people telling you how smart they are, putting all this stuff up there. And surely they must have value because they're showing you all these statistics and all this, this charts and graphs, surely there must be something good they're doing with all that time and all that money you're spending on it. Nope, it has nothing to do with any of that either. And it's certainly not the flavor of the month. You go to a conference, you go, you attend this little thing that you're doing right now with me, and you run home and you say, oh, I heard this guy, Paul Akers, it's so incredible. And you do it for a month, and then you fizzle out and you go right back to doing what you were doing before. It is not the flavor of the month. That is not what it is. 
This is a lifelong routine, a different way of looking at running a company, and I will explain. And what it is, though, I told you what it is not. It's not bureaucracy. It's not charging graphs. It's not the flavor of the month. It's a total participation system. That means everyone from the lowest person in your company, the janitor, whoever that is, everybody is thinking about continuous improvement. Everybody is being developed. Everybody is a part of the elimination of waste. And you accomplish that through Akata, which I'm getting to shortly. So I have a couple good friends in my life, and one of them is Rich Yoshingo. So Shigeo Shingo, some of you might know who that is. He's revered as one of the best industrial engineers in the world. He is from Japan, and he worked side by side with Taichi Ono to develop the Toyota production system. Taichi Ono was an engineer at Toyota, and he rose to the vice president level. He's just an amazing human being. And when he needed help, he brought Shigeo Shingo in. Well, Shigeo Shingo has a son. His name is Richio Shingo. He's a very good friend of mine, and this is a picture of him right here. And he used to be the president and started Toyota China. Brilliant guy and a very humble guy. And I spent a fair amount of time with Richio in Japan, and I brought him to the United States, and he's toured many, many companies in the United States dispensing his great wisdom. But one time, I was on a bus in Japan with Richio, and Richio was talking, get, talking away, and you know, there's about 30 people on the bus, and I said, Richio, you know, if I'm sitting on a park bench, and I walk up, and you're sitting on a park bench, and you're watching your grandchildren, and I've never met you before, and, and uh, I say, Richio, uh, my name is Paul Akers, what's your name, Richio Shingo? I said, oh, so what do you do, Richio? He goes, I'm the president of Toyota China, and uh, my, my, my father was Shigeo Shingo, one of the greatest industrial engineers of all time, part of building a Toyota production system. And I said to you, what is the Toyota production system? What is the Toyota production system? And Richio gave me one of the most profound answers in the whole world. And here it is. I want you to hear it with his own words because I was fortunate enough to record it. And I sit down next to you and I ask you what you do. And you tell me, I'm an expert in the Toyota production system. And I said to you, what is that? How would you describe that? No, no, you know nothing. And I should tell them, tell you. No oh, okay. I should tell you what the TPS is. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> TPS is the accumulation of small ideas of everybody. It's a, it's a... Love it. It's to perfect. You don't need to say anymore. <laughs> to when I hear him say that, literally it like brings tears to my eyes because it's such a profound answer. It's the accumulation of small ideas from everyone. So what is your kata? What is our kata? Our kata is making sure that we are getting small ideas from everyone every day to improve our business, our service, the way we do work, and the way we serve our customers. It's that simple. Now, there are five steps to our kata. I'm going to go over it in a minute, but this is the basis for what we're doing on a daily basis. So most people say, well, we come to work. If, you, if you're at my company, you say you come to work to make woodworking tools and equipment, innovative woodworking tools and equipment. That is not why we come to work at FastCap. It is not. Again, this is a contrarian way of thinking. This is not what they're gonna teach you at Harvard or when you get your MBA. It is not to make woodworking tools and equipment. That is not why we're coming to work. We come to work, and we make sure this is clear to everyone, we come to work to improve the way we make woodworking tools and equipment. This is our kata. Our routine is to improve the way we make woodworking tools and equipment. Completely juxtaposed to what everybody else is thinking. Hey, production, production, production. We're thinking, no, 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 no production. Forget about production. Think about quality. Think about improvement. And if we hit the quality and improvement moniker, if we hit that target, oh, the production is going to go through the ceiling and the customers are going to be so happy. This is the way we think. Our kata, our routine is very different than most people. Most people would consider this a detour, but it's really a shortcut 
in disguise. To contrast you and give you an idea of what I'm talking about, our company does tens of millions of dollars of business in 40 countries. In 21 years of business, we've had three price increases. Our sales keep going through the ceiling. Our costs keep going down. Our wages keep going up. Our profit keeps going up. Are you ready for this? No sales department, no marketing department, three people in the office, customer service people managing the sales inbound for over 40 countries and 3,000 distributors. Six people total in the entire company managing the office. No HR department, no marketing, no sales, no janitorial, no maintenance. Seems impossible. But if your kata is to improve everything every day and not do the work, but improve the work, then it's very, very possible. It's very plausible. And this is the way we approach things. So this man right here is Dr. Ken Snyder, head of the Shingo Institute. He's also a very good friend of mine, fluent in Japanese, is a Japanese historian, knows Japan really well, lived in Japan. And I spoke at the Shingo conference. And after I got done speaking at the Shingo conference, uh, I walked up to Ken and, and Ken told me a story and he started to tell me the story and I, and I said, stop, stop, stop. I pulled out my phone because this is part of my kata. I held my iPhone horizontally and I recorded Ken's words. Listen to what Ken's going to tell you about Shingo. Remember, this is Richio Shingo's son. So he knew Shigeo Shingo. And listen to what he says. It's not very Harvardish. You queued up. Hey, Ken, you were telling me about what Shingo said about the wasted 10 years. What was it? He spent 10 years studying statistical quality control, uh, a lot of Deming's work and things like that. He got enamored. He said, I got enamored by it. I loved it. And then after about 10 years, he gradually began to realize it was a waste. And he calls it his lost 10 years. Why did he call it a waste? Is because he was focusing on measuring and controlling defects instead of eliminating them instead of doing it instead of doing it yeah you're measuring instead of eliminating and you said about it put statistics put the hand put yeah he had a lot he had a lot of other critiques of using statistics another one was that he said it takes takes the problem of eliminating defects out of the hands of the operators who are dealing with it every day and into the hands of the engineers who are doing all the statistical analyses genius so there's shingo for you shingo on quality isn't that interesting? Here you have one of the best industrial engineers in the world. One of the co-founders of the Toyota production system. And he says his wasted 10 years of study. So our kata is not to study, so to speak, how to do lean. We do lean. We do improvements. It is our routine on a daily basis to find problems and eliminate them. This is exactly what Ken is talking about. And this has been the magic behind what we've been able to accomplish. So I'm going to play this video real quick. This is a, called What is Two Second Lean? So this is the essence of my book. And it's not going to, again, going to look very Harvard or Harvardish, or it's not going to look very MBA-ish, if you will. It's a very simple formula that I really sat back and I said, what is it that Toyota is doing? What is it they're really doing? And then I put my 21st century spin on it added a few little twists to it and the rest is history now my book is like in 14 language soon to be in 19 languages and it's a worldwide phenomena where we have literally tens of thousands of companies around the world millions of people have been affected by this simple concept and this video i made for five dollars with a company called fiverr if anybody's ever heard of it f-i-v-e-r-r -R. I just sent him a little couple of pictures and I did this audio clip on my iPhone, very lean. I didn't hire a production company to do this. This is five bucks. You ready? What is two second lean? It is simple. I took a world class business concept practiced by the top companies in the world, Toyota, Harley Davidson, Porsche, and made it fun and easy so anyone could tap into the power of daily continuous improvement. There are three easy steps to become a powerful lean thinker. First, Learn the eight ways. Overproduction, transportation, inventory, defects, overprocessing, motion, waiting, wasted human potential. Then you will see these different ways everywhere and it will drive you crazy. Second, 
you will be compelled to eliminate the waste you now see and make improvements every day that removes the waste in your life. Make it the first thing you do every day. Small, consistent, tiny, two-second improvements all hooked together day after day adds up to mountains of more free time, friend time, and play time. You see, there's nothing cool about being wasteful, and there is everything cool about becoming a lean thinker. Third, pull out your smartphone and shoot a quick video to show your improvements to your friends, family, and co-workers. That's it. Prepare to experience the power of becoming a lean thinker. So as you can see, it's simply seeing waste and fixing what bugs you. And the twist that I added was the concept of fixing what bugs you, which is kind of a simple concept. What bugs you? Stop. Instead of just like Rick on the, the newbie line, you know, they stopped the line, the bolt fell, and they said, no, we're not going to keep making cards. We're going to find out why that bolt was a problem, why it didn't thread in, and we're going to fix that. That's fixing what bugs you. And then the last thing is the part about the video, which is very, very interesting. So normally we want to get a big book. We want to make a process book. We make this big binder. Nobody reads it. It sits in the corner. Somebody spends, you know, hundreds of hours developing it. We don't do any of that nonsense. We simply take our iPhone, shoot a quick video, uh, post it on YouTube, put it on our, our chat, on our WhatsApp chat, which I'm going to talk about because that's part of our kata. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And, uh, and we share that information across our entire organization. We call that Yokotan. That means the dissemination of information laterally across an organization. So everybody's on the same page. Everybody's being inspired by this concept. It's such a simple thing. You know, we see a problem, we see waste, we fix what bugs us, and we record it on a video. This is part of our kata. And it's such a simple thing. There's no charge and graphs, no bureaucracy. It's just like, take charge, do it right now. Start eliminating waste, start making improvements. So what is our kata? Here we go. The first thing we do every day, there are five things that we do that, are, that represent who FastCap is day in and day out. Seven o'clock in the morning, we get there, we daily 3S. 3S simply means to sweep, sort, and standardize. We polish our entire company. I clean the toilets. I sweep the floor. There, everybody works together as a team. If you've seen any of our lean videos, our, our tour videos of FastCap, you can type in two second lean tours. They have over half a million views from around the world. That's not, that's not even possible. How could anybody watch a tour of a company that many people? I mean, Jack Welch gets 10,000 views when he posts up on, online. We have a half a million views. So the first thing we do is we 3S. We, our facility is the cleanest most pristine place you've ever been in your Sorry, life and it's a manufacturing facility you. and so that's number one and we sweep sort we standardize we sort all the crap out of our facility we make sure it's perfectly clean we look for problems the reason why we're 3 sing is to find problems and i learned this from the japanese that's the president of a major corporation in the blue sit down on his hands and knees and then he got me down on my hands and knees in a suit and made me clean and scrub his floor and he taught me this lesson of humility and working shoulder to shoulder with his people. So that's the first step. The second step is we fix what bugs us. When we're cleaning, we see a problem. We see a label coming off the wall. We see a power cord that's not wound up right. We see some tool that's laying in a rise somewhere and doesn't have a home. We stop and we create a standard for all those things. We're fixing what bugs us. We do this relentlessly. That's the second thing. And this is all happening in the first half hour. Although the fix what bugs you part can happen any time throughout the course of the day. So any time of the day, anybody can stop any time they want and make any improvement. They don't need permission to do it. They can just do it. Because we know that this is the most important thing we will do is improve our work. This is our kata. The next thing we do at 7.30, we've been there for a half hour now, I'm spending thousands of dollars because I got 50 people doing this, is we meet at a morning meeting. Every morning we meet as a team for a half hour and we go over our mistakes, we go over our improvements, we study the US Constitution, we have a history lesson, we study Ono's principles, we study Deming's principles, uh, we talk about six people that are grateful. We talk about different improvements that we made. It's so literally like a university level meeting. Our people are so smart. They're so aware. I'll give you a great example that we just did the, the documentary on Ernest Shackleton, the endurance down in Antarctica. I was down there two years ago and I saw, I, I retraced the steps of the endurance through South Georgia and then getting stuck in the Weddell Sea. And our people know about the resourcefulness of the crew of the endurance and 
So when this whole coronavirus thing came about, were our people in a panic? Were they like, oh crap, what are we gonna do? No, they said, we are the endurance. This is the attitude, the disposition our people took on. We will find a way around this problem. And we have worked every day. We have not lost one day of work. Our people have performed at an extraordinary level because they thought of themselves as Shackleton's men, the people of the men of the endurance. And why, so we studied that history lesson. Did it come in powerfully? Uh, did it come in, did it become useful to us? Absolutely, because our people think at an entirely different level. And we study historical great peoples of historical greatness nonstop in our company. And our people are well acquainted with both European, Asian, and American history. And it's just a beautiful thing to know that the development of our people is just making our company so much stronger. So our third component is this morning meeting and we do it every day. And then the next component is we make videos all day long. Everyone's making videos. Every process in our company from cleaning the toilet to setting up the injection molding machine to how we email a customer, a video is made for that and a process video is made. So we don't have any books and binders of how to do things. We don't have any of that. On every, every, and every place, whether it be cleaning the coffee maker, cleaning the toilet, or setting up the injection molding machine, there is a QR code by every place in our facility. It doesn't matter if you turn over a card that tells you to make something, there's a QR code, you scan it with your phone and it shows you the video on how to make the product, how to do the process. So these videos have become a powerful teaching platform, both for us internally and externally. That's why people around the world are watching what we're doing because we're posting these videos and people are saying, God, look what this company's doing, this is crazy. So this concept of making a short, simple video, 60 seconds to two minute long is part of our kata. This is our routine. This is what we do. This is what we believe in. And then our last thing is we have a team WhatsApp chat. So WhatsApp is a powerful platform for sharing videos. And I, I learned this actually in Kazakhstan. I worked in Kazakhstan for four years with a large construction company in that country. They do about $3 billion worth of business. I'm very close friends with the president of the company. And when I spoke to their 100 executives four or five years ago when I went there, after I got done speaking for one for eight hours straight, I was speaking, I was exhausted. They do things different in Kazakhstan. The president of the company got up and I was suggesting that we post all these videos to YouTube. And he said, no, 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 we're going to do something different. Everyone's going to get on WhatsApp right now. We're going to break the company up. Remember, they have 7,000 employees, 40,000 general contractors. They build oil refineries, roads, trains, condo, condo developments. They do everything. It's a massive company. He said, we're going to break the entire company into 100 group chats. And everybody's going to be on a 100 group improvement chat. And then everyone's going to start making these little improvements, just like Paul said. And we're going to post these quick little improvements to the chat. And everyone's going to see all these improvements and be inspired so they can make further improvements in their areas. And I learned it from Aiden. Aiden's the one that taught me this concept. I said, this is genius. So while I still post to YouTube, I teach the concept or I show the concept of using WhatsApp as a chat. So we break our company up. We have a fast cap WhatsApp chat. Everyone's posting videos nonstop on all the improvement. It's inspiring everybody. It's transmitting information laterally across an organization. We call this Yokoten. This is a Japanese word. Information spreading laterally, evenly, and consistently across an organization. And these are our five katas. We daily 3S, we clean our facility. Uh, we fix what bugs you. We have a morning meeting and we haven't worked yet. We have not worked yet. I spent thousands of dollars every day. We spend at least a minimum of an hour to an hour and a half every day before anybody works, only leaving us six and a half hours by the time you take out the breaks and the lunches and everything else. We're lucky if we work five and a half hours a day. But we get done more in five and a half hours than most companies get done in 40 hours. It's astounding. Every order ships. From the time we get the order to the time it ships, two hours fax to truck. You order something with us in two hours, it will be built, packaged, and in the truck. I've never heard of any company in the world accomplish that. We do thousands of custom orders for people every day. This is not stock items. This is stock items, but then we do all kinds of custom items and we do them that quick because we have refined every process to such an extent that it's just everything is easy for us. And if it's not easy, we stop, just like Rick stopped the line, and we fix what bugs us. So these, these are the things that we do. These are the five things that we do every day as a kata. Now, uh, this waste is swirling around all of you, and certainly it's swirling around us even to this day. But the question is, do you know, do you realize how much waste 
is swirling around you. It's like a tornado. You spend more time screwing around trying to get things done than getting things done. If you're not predisposed to this concept, if you haven't developed the kata of developing your people for the purpose of eliminating waste, do the accumulation, as Rich Yoshingo said, do the accumulation of small ideas from everyone. So the question is, can you see the waste? Can you see the waste in your organization? It's everywhere. So I recently checked into a hotel. I was speaking down in Atlanta just before this coronavirus went crazy. And I checked into the hotel. It was a beautiful hotel. And they had done something so cool. When I sat down in the, in the room, I opened up my laptop. And what's the first thing you got to do? You got to plug it in, right? And guess what? What does everyone do when they go to plug in? They look around. Where's the plug? Where's the plug? Look what this hotel did. Look how smart this was. I've never seen any hotel in the world ever do this. They put a visual control right where the plug is on the side of the desk. So I didn't hunt around for anything. This is lean thinking. This is strong visual management. This is simplifying everything. So everywhere you go in our facility, you see things like this. You don't see people struggling to do anything. You just see processes that are just a, a pure joy to perform. It reduced time and effort. Who doesn't want to live in an environment where, every, where reduced time and effort is part of everything that's happening on a daily basis? So we call this concept, wherever you ask the question, that's where the answer should be. So I put my laptop down on the desk in this hotel, and the first thing I do is I say to myself, where's the power? I, I think about that question in my head, where's the power? The minute I asked the question, the answer was right in front of me. This is the way lean thinkers think. Wherever you ask the question, that's where the answer should be. So uh, Saturday Night Live, nobody's done it better than Saturday Night Live to describe to you really what it is I'm talking about. So I want to play this quick little funny video that really typifies what it is I'm suggesting you do as part of your kata. When we find problems, what do we do? Oscar Rogers. Hello, Seth. Hello, Amy. Hello, Seth and Amy. Oscar, last week the stock market was up nearly 500 points, and this week it's down more than 400 points. Do you see any hints that this roller coaster ride will be ending anytime soon? Very good analogy, Seth. The market is very much like a roller coaster ride, and I do believe it is about to end. But before we get off, we will come to find that our digital camera has fallen out of our shirt pocket, our brand new Ray Bans have flown off our head, and we are about to financially buff on ourselves. So, what do, you, what do we do? Well, it's actually very simple. Somebody needs to get on top of this situation and fix it! <laughs> Seth, I haven't slept in two weeks. Somebody needs to look at this mess and fix it! Tomorrow morning, when I have my breakfast cereal, the morning paper better read, it's been fixed! <laughs> fix it! Fix all of it! Now! So what... Uh, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, um, if you don't mind, Oscar, what exactly should be done? Well, it's not rocket science, Seth. It's a simple three-step process. Step one, fix! <laughs> Step two, it! <laughs> Step three, fix it! <laughs> Then repeat steps one through three until it's all fixed. So you remember when Rick at the Numi plant, you know, they were, they were building cars. The Japanese was right there next to him. They had one Japanese person to one, Jap to one American side by side. And all of a sudden, the bolt didn't work and they stopped the line. What did they do? They did what Oscar Rogers suggests. They fixed it. They fix it now. It all better be fixed now. This is our kata. This is the way we think. We, our routine is to fix everything and to fix it now. Not put, we don't put it on a list and say, oh, someday that needs to be fixed. We just stop the line and we fix it. And I know you're all thinking to yourself, well, then you're not getting your work done. Remember, we get done in eight hours, what takes most companies 40 hours to get done. We get so much more done. It's unbelievable. Our, our, our production per person, is north of $370 an hour per person. I mean, you can't even get your heads around those numbers. They make everybody look like they don't know what they're doing. Why? Because of Oscar Rogers.
We fix everything. It's not a detour. It's a shortcut. And you got to change your way of thinking. It was very difficult for me to change my way of thinking. This is not the way I thought, but I'm a contrarian now. I'm not even interested in doing anything that everybody else is doing. I actually reject what everybody else is doing. Summarily, I am the consummate contrarian. I could care less what everybody else is doing. For instance, I'll give you an example. So we're very fortunate that we don't really have to ever look for anybody to work for us. I told you, we don't have an HR department. Everybody wants to work for us. I get resumes from people around the world all day long. Everybody wants to come to work for us. I, you know, do so you have any jobs? Can I do an internship? You know, everybody nonstop wants to work for us. But we don't accept resumes. You what, Paul? You don't accept resumes? No, we don't accept resumes. Those are all freaking lies. Those are lies. We don't want your lies on black and white paper. I don't want it. We reject it. We don't accept any resumes at our company. If you want to work for us, you have to take your phone and make a one to two video, minute video and show me and tell me about yourself. That's what we do. We do a video resume. I don't know of anybody in the world that does this. And immediately it weeds out all the people that don't want to change, innovate, and try something new. So we immediately bypass all the nonsense that most people are going through, going through resumes, calling people up, figuring out a time to interview them. We don't do any of that stuff. They send us a video resume. If it's good, we bring them in for a quick interview. If we like them, we offer them a test day. And we pay them for the test day. We haven't hired anybody. And all of our people are watching them and working with them side by side. And they're asking themselves, do we want this person to be a part of our team? Can they pull the row hard enough? Can they be a Shackleton? Can they be a part of the team of the endurance? Guess what? We don't have any HR director telling us whether or not we're going to hire this person. Our people hire the people who work for us. At the end of the day, we bring our people in. Everyone has worked with them. And we say, should we offer them a test week? And if we don't have 100% unanimous, that everyone doesn't say, yeah, they're a good person, they ask good questions, they worked hard, they were alert, you know, they seem to be really interested. If we don't get 100% on that, we say, thank you very much, here's your money, we pay you, and you're gone. We don't waste our time. But then if they're good, we let them have a test week. And then after that test week, we bring everybody in who's worked with them, because we put them in all different departments in all different situations. And everybody's watching them. At the end of the test week, we bring everybody in, and everybody again. 100% unanimous. If they're a keeper, we offer them a job. If they're not, we say it was really nice, great, here we pay you for a week and they're gone. I don't know if anybody does this stuff. Now you know why you don't have an HR department. Now you know why our, our profitability keeps going up, our sales keep going up, our costs keep going down. Because we don't do all the BS, all the waste, all the nonsense that most companies are caught up in. We don't have, we don't have any part of it. Remember, tens of millions of dollars worth of business, no sales department, no marketing, no HR, no maintenance, no janitorial service, six people in the office. Never heard of it anywhere in the world. We're contrarians. We reject summarily the way everybody else does business. We're thinking totally different. We have a different way of solving problems. We have a kata that supports it. And then we work. So here's one last example I'm going to give you to give you an idea of the way we think. So uh, this is an airline ticket I received from Delta Airlines many years ago. And I like to show this people because it really, it really helps people understand what we're talking about and how much contrarians we really are. So I looked at this ticket, and remember, I'm a carpenter, I'm a DNC student, I struggled through college, I've got dyslexia, I've got all kinds of problems. And I look at this ticket, and this is nothing but sheer chaos to me. This is yeah. just a nightmare on steroids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sent it to my graphic designer who's 23 years old. Remember, we do tens of millions of dollars of business. We're not Delta Airlines. We don't do billions of dollars worth of business. We don't have the massive infrastructure and support team. We have one guy who's 23 years old, who's not college educated and was not trained as a graphic designer, but he was trained and developed as a lean thinker. And I said, Graham, can you make me a lean ticket? And he said, sure, no problem, bring it on. And 
in less than 15 minutes, this is what he came up with. And remember, we're not Delta Airlines. Look what's going on there. Great visual controls, great standardization, everything queued up in exactly the order you need the information. First thing you need to know is where you're going. Next thing is what gate, what time you're boarding, where you're sitting on the plane, and what time the plane departs. 15 minutes, but Delta still hasn't figured this out. But for us, this is child's play. It's so simple for us, we don't even think twice about it. But we spend a lot of time in our kata developing our people to see waste, understand the power of visual management, understand the power of making things simple and not complicating everything. So you tell me, what ticket do you want? The top one or the bottom one? Okay, I take it to Canada. I'm speaking up in Canada. They look at it and they go, oh, well, I see a two-second improvement. Turn the direction of the plane around so that when you're looking at the ticket, it's orientated correctly so you don't have to reverse things in your mind. I didn't get proud and say, oh, well, I designed this ticket. Don't tell me what to do. I said just the opposite. That's a genius idea. That's a beautiful idea. Let's make that change right away. I sent a message to my graphic design team before I finished speaking, got off the stage. It was already emailed to me and I posted it up on the stage. Done. Everything just in time. Stop the line. Fix it now. This is the way we think about everything. We don't make excuses on why we can't do things. So the question is, why can we do this? Because we see waste. Remember I said waste is swirling around you like a tornado. It's swirling around me like a tornado. Your wealth is in your waste. You're worried about the next marketing program, the next sales program, the next product. You're worried about all this nonsense. It's all nonsense. Your wealth is in your waste. Okay, so when we improve something, these are the four criteria that we go by. Safety, quality, simpler, and speed. So here we go. We're going to end it with this just so you understand how we look at an improvement. So the first thing, let's look at the top ticket, our improvement, and the bottom ticket. Is it safer? Nah. Not really. It's not, it has nothing to do with safety. So safety is not, doesn't really apply in this case. Yeah, you could say it's maybe safer because I don't have to have a heart attack, but it's really, you know, I'm going to have less heart attacks because I'm not going to miss my plane, but it's not really a safety issue. What about quality? The, does it help the customer decipher the information they need and the purpose of the ticket more effectively? Absolutely. The quality, it wins in spades. So we're not arguing about, amongst my team, we're not arguing whether or not it's improvement, whether or not it's Bob's ideas, Mary's ideas, George's ideas, Martha's idea. We never have that argument at my company. We don't have that argument because we're applying this simple four-step criteria to every improvement. We just ask the question, is there a safety issue? No, no safety issue. Does it improve the quality? Yeah, it's a better quality, but it takes more time to do it. We don't care. If it takes more time and it improves the quality, we don't care. Everyone thinks lean is about going faster. It is the least important criteria. The least important criteria. Our target is quality. Quality actually makes things go faster because you make less mistakes. Mistakes and defects cost a fortune. Just not making mistakes and defects will speed everything up. So quality is number one. And then we look at it simpler. Is the improvement that we made, does it simplify the process? Emphatically, it's simpler. There's no question it's simpler. So we met that criteria. The quality is better, the simpler. And is it faster to derive the information you need? What gate I need to go to? What time is boarding? Where do I sit on the plane? Absolutely. So we met three of the criteria right there. And this is the way we look at every improvement we make. And that is how we have developed this powerful kata of continuous improvement, as Richio Shingo says, the accumulation of small ideas from everyone. There you go. Questions? Hi, Paul. Uh, I'm Chuck Kotcher from Colorado, and just great presentation. Loved it. Um, one of the things we do in Scaling Up is uh, we uh, have something called the process accountability chart that we take everybody through. And um, how would you go about, you know, deploying what you do, would you first identify the processes? Because that's what we're asking our clients to do is identify their core processes so they can begin on a journey of improvement and driving and driving scale. Um, so how would you go about that? Would it be, would you have some tips on how we can identify those processes and then, and then I guess deploy uh, the two second lean? 
You know, you certainly could, Chuck, but what I would tell you to do, to be honest with you, is I wouldn't get all wrapped up in one particular process. I would just immediately say, what are the processes that are driving you crazy? What are the processes where the bottlenecks are? What are the processes where all the accumulation of work and it's not getting out the door in a timely fashion? Where are the processes that people are burdened down because they can't get it done in a timely fashion? Mm -hmm. And I would fix, I would focus on fixing what bugs you in those areas. I wouldn't get overly analytical. I would just look around. Where are mm -hmm. the bottlenecks? Where are people frustrated? Where are people overburdened? I would keep it that simple. Okay, so I guess maybe with the, the way we do scaling up, maybe identify what those processes are at a high level, which is, you know, the big the bigger process and then dig in like you're talking about. That makes you, you, could, you could do it at a higher level, but let me, let me just say this. So the two second lean model and, and lean in general is focused on, we call this the Gemba level. The Gemba, uh -huh. the Gemba means the shop floor. That's where the work actually happens. So we really are heavily focused on the shop floor, not the high level people, not the people in the office looking and finding what the problems is and then telling everybody else what to fix. Just the opposite. We want the people on the shop floor who are doing the work to tell us what the problem is so then we can help them solve their problem. That's what leaders' jobs are. Our job is to help the Gemba people solve the problem, not tell the Gemba problem people what problems to solve. Mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. Thank you. Okay. My pleasure. Thanks, Paul. We had another question about how you apply this to your home and personal life. <laughs> oh, my house is my house is incredible. So uh, yeah, wow. So here, well, everywhere you go in my house, it's incredible. But I'll just show you right now. So this is my drawer with all my. You see my drawer. <laughs> So I never look for anything. Everything's exactly where I need it, when I need it. And I just don't struggle uh, to do anything. If I took you through a virtual tour of my home, uh, I think most of you, your jaw would drop right now. I have 13 acres of the most beautifully manicured yards on the planet. Uh, nobody has more beautiful yards than me, and I'm not exaggerating. They're Japanese gardens. I have one person full-time that manages my home and my yards. And if you went to our facility, our maintenance facility area, your job would drop. It's all on YouTube. You can just go on YouTube and you'll see everything we do because I posted almost everything. And it just it'd take your breath away. It, we're always stopping and fixing everything. And so the result is instead of having 10 people manage 13 acres of the most beautiful yards in the planet, we have one person doing it. That was amazing. Oh, great, great presentation. Thank you. I Thank wonder, you. Uh, so this is all centered around kind of like what you're doing, improving. And I wonder how did you kind of like new products, right? New innovation, something that doesn't exist, be it a new ERP. Mm, I love it. I love it. Well, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question exactly, but I can tell you, again, I told you we have 800 products on the market. And so I think maybe your question was, how do we develop new products? Or that was not your question. Let me make sure I get the question right. Yeah, new products, anything completely new. So you can't really right. talk kind of like with, good. Good, good, uh, good. you know, something absolutely new. It doesn't matter. So you're going to be blown away by this. I mean, again, you want to talk about a contrarian. What I'm going to tell you right now should drop all of you to the floor. You ready? So all of our products come from our customers. Our customers are the people that are using our product. They're the Gemba people. They know the problems. We don't know the problems. Even though I'm a professional woodworker, I don't do it professionally anymore. So who am I to tell them what they need? They tell me what they need. They bring me an idea. And guess what? This is the kicker. There's no patent. And we pay them a 5% royalty. So they bring us an idea. We have no obligation, zero, to pay them one dime. There is no intellectual property, but yet we still do it. Now, remember I told you earlier, we have no marketing and sales department. Why do you think we have no marketing and sales department? Because our customers are telling everyone worldwide about what we do. They are our marketing and sales department. And I don't care what you say, there is nothing more powerful than your customer talking about you. You could write all the slick ads you want. You could do all the advertising you want. But when your customer picks up their iPhone and says, hey, 
I just use this fast cap product and it's incredible. And it just so happens that I came up with a better idea and I called Paul Akers and I got a hold of him directly and his cell phone number is on the website. What CEO of a major company can you get a hold of and call directly and they'll answer the phone call? Now you know why we don't have a sales and marketing department. We don't need a sales and marketing department. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Great. Thank you. So, Paul, we appreciate so much you joining us. I think we got a lot of great ideas from that. I know I did from, from moving forward, some good ideas for both personal and professional. Thanks, Paul, for your presentation. Uh, greetings My from pleasure. Kampala. Um, oh, wonderful. Quintessential coach, a business coach approaching you. How would you, how would you tick him off as a, as a lean thinker? How would you want a business coach to approach you if, if we're pitching for business? At, what an uh, interesting uh, question. And it's, all, it's Elton, right? Is it Elton yeah. or El, uh, Elton? Okay. Elton. That's a great question. Well, first and number one, a love for people. First and number one, someone who loves people, loves the idea of people uh, flourishing. Second thing would be humility. The ability to say they don't know it all and they're, they're just eating it up, the idea that they're learning and people show them improvements and they go, wow, I never thought of that. And that's the coolest thing. These are the characteristics that we look for people that we hire and who are in the leadership role at FastCap. They're always humble, willing to give credit to other people. They don't have to be the know-it-all. They're just like, wow, check this out. We just had this new guy, Bill, who just started working for us two weeks ago, and they came up with a solution, and I've been at FastCap for 13 years, and I never thought about that. That's what we're looking for. Did that Thanks answer the question? Yeah, contrarian. <laughs> really awesome. Really awesome. Okay. Paul, again, thank you so much for your for making time on your birthday to talk with our My organization. Pleasure. Sorry we couldn't see you in person in Dallas, but this has been a great week of learning for us. So we're thankful that you would were willing to participate with us on this. Uh, My pleasure, Kristen. And we'll share the replay with you as well, so you have it. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks everybody. Yeah, Bye. Paul. Thank you again. Take care, My pleasure. Brought to you by PaulAkers.net, where you'll find all Paul's books and lean resources for free, including the new two second lean play app, like Audible, but free. To listen to Lean is Lean on the two second lean play app at PaulAkers.net.